Man, I love the opportunity to get to be here with you guys tonight. And uh, I have to say, so many thoughts have gone through my mind. And uh, First of all, the coolest moment in youth ministry in a long time of my life was watching a collision happen up here earlier. That was so awesome. For the love of candy, what we will do. I love it. I do have a burning question. Emma, was the sock moist? Oh, it was a hairy. At least it was dry, so that's good. <laughs> um, I was also just during worship time. Uh, I just I get nostalgic when I get to hang out with you guys because uh, mo- I still have not been senior pastor uh, longer than I was youth minister. Uh, I've been I was youth minister for 17 years before becoming senior pastor. So, man, this just gets me fueled just watching you guys have fun seeing you stand and sing these songs and i had this flashback i don't know if if tim ever told you the backstory of him coming here but i remember uh seems like so long ago he and i met up at least i think just twice for breakfast meetings and he was pursuing the potential of starting a brand new church in independence actually um and I was praying about that with him and just saying, man, whatever we could do to help, we want to be an encouragement to what God's doing in your life. And neither of us had any idea that probably, I guess it was within a year of the last time we met, that he'd become youth minister here. And I love it. I'm so glad he's here. You all are so blessed to have him as your fearless leader. And then on top of that, these amazing interns. We've had such a great intern program for years now, and it's only growing and growing and growing. Uh, so you're so blessed to have that. I was actually also reminiscing that for many years, my first many years of youth ministry, I was praying, Lord, give us someone to play a guitar or something. We had no band whatsoever. I'd find a song and just play it over the speaker, and we'd try to sing along. And it was, it was uh, you know, we made do. Uh, but as I reminisce about youth ministry, <clears throat> I think some things are so much still the same. Some things that I used to do that I'm thinking, man, I don't know if I'd ever do that again. Some things probably would be like, we used to like be rough on each other, especially like at camp with the guys in the guys' rooms. We did stuff that I think I would be fired for now. We would like towel snap each other to where we looked like we'd been beaten and we'd go home and nobody, you know, got in trouble for it. But uh, I don't think that's a good idea now. I remember one of my first youth events I ever did was a, y'all know what spam is? You ever heard of, who has never heard of Spam? Yeah, the meat, the canned meat Spam. Okay, only, okay. so most of you have heard of Spam. We had a Spam night where all we did is play games with Spam. And we, the, the big epic finale was we literally, we bought, we, in the community in which I did this, it was really awkward to roll out of that store with shopping carts full of Spam. They were like, what are you doing? Oh, I'm just, you know, youth ministry. <laughs> but we bought a bunch of Spam, and for the grand finale event, we had a chocolate-covered Spam fight at our church. And I'm here to tell you, that was a one-time event. We never did that again, mainly because of how terrible it was the worst smell that I've ever smelled. The, 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 the grounds outside smelled bad for days. Most of us had to literally, we're like, oh, we, we have to burn our clothes. This is it ruined everything we had on. It was terrible. But we never forgot it either. We had a good time. Um, but stuff like that is weird. You're probably not going to have a spam night anytime soon here at Hickory Grove, I don't think. Uh, but there's things that remain the same that make youth ministry great. I think the goals are still the same now as they were when I first started. Number one goal being that we just want to really lift up Jesus Christ as the center of all things. Like he is the way we experience life change. He's the only one that can transform a heart and transform a life. And so that's always been central. That's always key. And and we we sung about him. We sung about singing about him just now. And we're going to read about him here in a minute. But on top of that too, I think a close second to that, especially in youth ministry, is that we want everyone to feel a sense of belonging, to, to, to feel like they matter. And that's super important in youth ministry. And I remember some of the greatest seasons of youth ministry that I, that I got to be a part of, that was huge. That it seemed like there was a closeness, a unity, some kind of transcending quality of what was going on 
where if you showed up to something like this, you belonged, you felt welcome, you felt like you were a part of something that you wanted to be a part of. And in some of the best seasons of youth ministry that I've experienced, it was next level. And the, the, what, made, what made it go next level was not just the adult leaders were doing that, but the, the students, the youth themselves, were taking some very intentional actions to help people see that they matter. In fact, this is what I want you to remember. If you forget everything else that I tell you tonight, I want you to remember this sentence. Your superpower that can change this world and this culture is making someone feel like they matter. You really have the ability to do that. Your generation, your status as a student, a teenager, what you decide to do has great ripple effects in your school, in this room, on this campus, in your home, in your world. It really, really matters what you do, what you say, how you act, how you treat other people. And you have the ability to do this. You can make Grove Youth next level incredible where lives are being transformed by just making people understand that they really matter when they come on this campus, when they come in this room. That is next level. What I have learned to be true is that this is how God has set up his kingdom. Jesus talked a lot about the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. He used that phrase a lot. Yeah, I think there's some other synonyms of that. You know, the body of Christ is also described in the New Testament. The bride of Christ, um, the family of God. I think all of those things, what makes it so unique is those two things I told you that are a key to a great youth ministry they are made possible by the kingdom of God. Like when you're a part of God's kingdom, you come to understand how Christ is exalted and the power that he has in our lives to give us peace that doesn't make sense, to give us power to transform and be changed. But on top of that, there's something else horizontal, not just vertical, between all of us who follow Jesus. There's a camaraderie, a brotherhood, a sisterhood, a family feel that even though we're all so uniquely different, extroverted, introverted, quirky, not so quirky, whatever. I don't know what you want to say. Use all the descriptions you want, but yet we're unified in this thing that God created. That's powerful. But I believe the key to that is some intentionality. Like God gives us things to do. Jesus teaches us things to do to build his kingdom on earth. And, and I think the, the action verb I want to give you tonight to be thinking about, like I want you to think, Say this to yourself, not out loud. You know, say your name. Okay, I'm Bill Clark. Uh, if you do this, you can make a huge difference for God in another student's life. And the thing that I'm saying is the key is a thing just simply called neighboring. Neighboring. I want to read to you. I would say this is probably makes the top three list of stories that Jesus ever told. It's called the uh, parable of the Good Samaritan. Maybe you've heard it before. Maybe you haven't. It's a pretty epic story. I want to read it for you. Uh, and there's actually a little bit of a backstory to it. And you'll catch it as I read it to you. It's Luke chapter 10, starting at verse 25. And here's what it says. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him, and it, him is Jesus here, to put Jesus to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to in inherit eternal life? Pretty important question. Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? Here's a little side note. If you want to experience something pretty mind-blowing, Jesus got asked a lot of questions. He rarely answered them. He usually responded with other questions, and this is a good example of that. He throws it back to him. What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he, the lawyer, answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. This is great, because in other parts of the Bible, Jesus said these very things. He called them the greatest commandments. So this is a pretty good answer, and it goes on to say in verse 28, and he, meaning Jesus, said the lawyer, you've answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But he, the lawyer, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? It's a very telling question, like, who do I have to do this to? Who am I required to treat this way? Is kind of what he's asking. Jesus replied, 
and he goes into his story. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii, so those were coins worth a day's wages, so two days' wages, and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? The lawyer said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. All right, this is cool. Let me tell you why this story Jesus told is radical. First, what makes this story radical is the hero of this story is a Samaritan. Jews and Samaritans did not get along. That's not even a good way to put it. Basically, Jewish people looked down on the Samaritans. They considered them not true Jewish people. And the main reason for that, there's other things in the history, such as some Samaritan people at one point made war with some Jewish people, and there was so a rivalry existed in their history. But one of the bigger reasons is that Samaritans were born of both Jewish and non-Jewish descent. In other words, it was like uh, intermarriage between Jewish people and non-Jewish people, which in the history of Jewish people was frowned upon and looked down upon. And so the Jewish people said, you uh, can't worship in our temple, you can't worship in our synagogues, you can't be anywhere near what we do religiously, you need to go figure that out on your own. So Samaritan people kind of lived in their own villages and had their own place of worship separate from the Jewish people. There was definitely a segregation, if you will. And yes, very much racial, for being honest, straight up what was going on. And very religious as well. So Jesus is teaching a story to a devout, respected expert of Jewish law. He's telling him a story and makes the hero of the story someone that, by law, they look down upon. So it's a pretty big deal. That's one thing that made it radical. Another thing that makes it radical is Jesus kind of has a subtle sub-point to this story. Did you, did you catch what identities the two who passed by the injured man were? One was a Levite. Now, a Levite, Levites were one tribe of Israel, one of 12 tribes. The Levite tribe were a tribe of priests. And the other person is called a priest. So basically, two priests saw the injured man half dead and kept going. Now, it doesn't go into detail in this story, but those hearing it would have understood why a priest and a Levite would dodge this injured man. It's between Jericho and Jerusalem. They, we don't know which direction they were going in, but if they were definitely going towards Jerusalem, chances are they were going to do their duties as a priest. But guess what? In Jewish law... If you touch blood, if you touch a dead corpse, you're unclean. And you have to separate yourself from your family, from all other Jewish people, and it usually takes at least seven days to become ceremonially clean again before you can go to the temple or go to the synagogue. In other words, they're on their way to work in the temple, but if they touch a dead body or blood on their way to the temple, they might as well go back home because they can't do anything. They have to go get ceremonially clean. Jesus makes a point that if your religion actually prevents you from helping people in their deepest needs, then I question how good that religion is. And Jesus had a little side point there with that. Having said all of that, there's something that's very not radical about this story, and that's the actual act of neighboring. So the Samaritan was the hero of the story. He was the best at neighboring in the story. And I want to break down to you what I would call the not-so-radical acts of neighboring. If you look at everything that the Samaritan did, it is so simple. And I'm hoping that tonight you'll think, man, 
I need to do what Jesus said at the end of this story. Go and do likewise. These are very simple things. So here they are. Notice. That's the first one. Notice. The Samaritan saw the injured uh, victim of robbery laying there, half dead. Saw it happen. It starts there by noticing. And don't take that for granted. Don't say, okay, duh, Bill. Listen, I think there's many times that there's an opportunity to neighbor around us and we don't even notice it. We're too busy thinking about ourselves. All of us do it. We're too busy thinking about ourselves, heading toward the next thing to notice what's happening right there beside us, right there around us. Maybe we're even so used to seeing an opportunity to neighbor, someone hurting, someone going through something, someone who looks very alone. We're so used to seeing it and ignoring it that we don't even notice that we're ignoring it anymore. I think that's a real danger. But that's the first step. Just notice. Just notice the need around you. Second thing that happened is stopping. That's it. The Samaritan did something that the priest and Levite didn't do. He stopped. He didn't just keep going. That's a big deal right there. And then the third thing that happened is the Samaritan walked towards the injured man. The other ones went around and avoided, but the Samaritan walked towards the need. This is a big deal. And this past Sunday uh, morning in the the main worship center, uh, I was telling the folks up there um, about a group of runners that I run with that about four times a year we'll do what's called, we call it the give back run. And we take donations, put it in backpacks, and put it on our backs. And we run, and we're actually going through Covington and Cincinnati to give stuff to homeless people. Clothing, food, water, gift cards to places that they can walk to to get uh, a hot meal, a hot beverage or whatever, cold beverage. So we do that. But I think it's so, like, I have to tell you, that's great that we do that. But what I notice is the dichotomy between my normal life in that three hours that I do four times a year. In my normal life, I've caught myself making sure to not make eye contact with a homeless person that I'm walking by or driving by. And it's because I feel ashamed I have nothing to give them or I don't have time to give them or I choose not to give them or I choose not to take time. But then in the give back run, me and my running friends, we're literally staring down people hoping that, okay, that person looks like they need help, and then we will stalk them and go find them and give them something because we're driven. It's the mission. It's the point. It's the goal. I think the problem is is we say that the things that God calls us to do, that's this tiny little compartment of our life. That's the, the mission trip or the mission event or the one week of camp. That's not my life. That's just a little part, a little tiny part. And I've, I've wondered, what if we strip that away and start seeing everything we do as an opportunity to be a neighbor to someone? Maybe then we'll notice, stop, and walk towards. The last two are the part we think of when neighboring. Care. Number four is care. So that's what the Samaritan did next. He noticed, he stopped, he walked towards, and then saw what the needs were and started meeting them. And in this case, they were very physical in nature. The man probably couldn't even talk to him. He was half dead, Jesus said. He bound up the wounds and literally met a physical need. Sometimes it is a physical need. Sometimes it's an emotional need. Sometimes it's a relational need. But just take time to care. And then the last thing that I will tell you, I did not notice this ever as many times. And I've read this story many, many, many times. Getting ready to be with you all tonight is the first time I really caught the fifth thing. And this fifth thing is super powerful, and it's just remember. Here's the thing. That was a really cool thing that Samaritan did. If the story would have ended that he gave two denarii to the innkeeper and then went on his way, I'd still be like, dude, you rock. That's awesome. Way to let God use you, man. Man, way to be the hands and feet of Jesus, man. Way, way to sacrifice whatever you had on your schedule and to sacrifice two days' wages and to sacrifice time, energy, man. Way to go. But this guy told the innkeeper, you know, I know it's probably going to cost more to take care of him, so I'll repay you whatever you pay. And he did not use the word if. 
He said, when I come back. Like, I never caught it till getting ready for tonight that in the story Jesus told, the man had already made a commitment to come back. I'm going to be back. I will be back. And when I come back, I'll make sure I settle up with you, buddy. That's huge. And that's super powerful. In youth ministry, listen, if there's someone in this room you've never met before, I mean, I know we have a lot of people in here. I get it. But it's, it's not like it's New York City in here. You can actually probably learn a lot of names in here. Like, but if there's a lot of people in here and you don't know their names, like, man, if before you leave tonight, if you just introduce yourself, hi, my name is Bill, what's your name? Tell me your name. And then I have this little trick I learned a long time ago. I try to use people's names at least three times before I leave them. Oh, uh, you're so so wait, your your name is uh Tim? Tim, what's your last name? Tim Blake? God, oh, cool. Well, Tim Blake, tell me, man, how are you doing today? Man, that's awesome, Tim Blake. You know, it kind of sounds weird to keep repeating your name, but that's how I remember it because I've used it a few times. What do you think? Have you ever, ever had someone remember your name and it blew your mind? Man, that happens to me every now and then. I'm like, what? Like, you remember who I am? That is, I felt like I mattered. I must be at least a little bit significant for someone to remember my name the next time I see them. Listen, that's the power of remembering. And it don't have to be just remembering a name. It's just remembering to follow up. Like if you had so you saw someone sitting all by themselves here or at your school, you go talk to them a little bit. And listen, I've done that before and I felt like it like probably 40% of the time it don't necessarily go well. I've had that go over like a lead balloon before. Like, I'm like, hey, I, this person looks like they're by themselves. I'm going to go talk to them. And I start talking to them, and I'm realizing that I'm creeping them out, which maybe that's just something I do. I don't know. But I can tell that they're not necessarily seeming to enjoy it. But I have found out much later that that did make a difference, that they were thankful I did that, that they did, even though they were trying to play it kind of cool and not act uber excited that someone talked to them, it mattered to them. But the, the big thing is, what if you go back and try again? And what if you go back and talk again? And what if you remember their name? And what if you, that person was going through a rough time last Wednesday. I'm going to go find them and see, hey, has that gotten better? Did that, did that situation get better at all? There's power in remembering. These are simple things. Look at how not radical these are. Notice, stop, walk towards, care, and remember. That's it. It takes very little, like, IQ for me to do these things. I can totally do them. And here's a thing that I want you to remember. Listen, for most everyone in this room, for most everyone in this room, you're here because you've gotten some of that. To some of that, at the very least, maybe all of that. Some of you have gotten all of that from multiple people in this room. Some of you may be here and you're like, man, I need some of that. And I'm coming, but I feel still feel very disconnected. I don't feel like I truly am a part yet. Man, hang in there because I'm hoping everybody in this room will accept the challenge of what Jesus said at the end of this story. After talking to this expert in law, he said, man, go and do what this guy did. Just go do what this guy did. That's what it means to be a neighbor. This is what it means to be religious. That stuff. That's what it means to be churchy. This is, what it's, this is what it's like to be like Jesus on this earth. This is what it's like to represent him on this earth. Man, I don't see Zimbabwe on the list. Like, man, I guess I got to go to Zimbabwe for God. Oh, I'm really not doing much for God. Man, you could do this here. You can do this at your school. You can do this at your house. You can do this on your team. You can do this at Skyline. You can do this at Starbucks, Dunkin'. Man, you can do that anywhere you go. You can be like this. I'm here to tell you, every one of you, have the power, a superpower, to make someone feel like they matter. doesn't matter what your personality is. You might be, Bill, I'm introverted. I can't do this stuff. I'll, I think introverts do this better than extroverts do because I'm an extrovert. And I might notice and stop and start walking towards, and then I see someone else. I'm like, oh, what's going on? You know, I get distracted because I want to meet everybody. Sometimes the introverts of this world are way better at this because you can focus and say, man, there's someone right there. That, that could use some encouragement. Everybody else is having party. Everybody else is in the gaga pit over there. But I see that person. Maybe they could use some encouragement. I'm going to go over there. 
I don't care what your personality is, what your background is. Every one of you can do this. So here's what I want us to do as we close. Can we ask God to help us neighbor? And, and let me tell you what's at stake. I remember when I finally started going to church as a high schooler is because I, I remember the name and I remember his face and we've kept in touch. His name is Brad Hall. Brad Hall neighbored to me. And I started going to church as a sophomore in high school. And it was that summer I went to a camp. He didn't even go to that camp. It was a totally thing that was different than what that church did. At that camp, I finally said yes to Jesus. And then went to that church that Brad Hall invited me to even more often, got baptized at that church. But Brad Hall, God used a guy that I thought was pretty cool, taking the time to talk to me in the hallway at my high school and ask me to come to his church. I'm here to tell you, it's that simple. Every one of you can do it. Every one of you can be a part of the transformation God wants to do in someone's life to help them to know that they were made by him and that their life matters if you just do those things. So let's ask God to help us to leave here and, yes, go crush people in dodgeball and then do this too, all right? Will you bow with me as we pray?